All right, guys, I decided it might be easier if I made a video for you for um, the rest of the notes so that you don't have to flip back and forth and you can kind of stop it and uh, you don't have to rely on me to go through and get your notes. So um, I recommend you kind of watch the notes. And when I get to a question where I'm asking you a question, pause it and, and see if you can figure it out first before I give you the answer. So um, we are going to start off with 4.4, which is acceleration. We're Call that acceleration is a vector quantity, which means that it has direction and magnitude. Okay, a lot of times I will just ask for the magnitude, uh, but know that it should have a direction attached to it as well. Um, and so it is the rate in which velocity is changing. So how fast is the velocity changing? Okay, um, and for the units, well, we're going to look at the formula for the units. So the formula is uh, change in velocity divided by the time interval. Well. Change in velocity, your, your speed, if you will, is going to be measured in meters per second, and your time is measured in seconds. So meters per second per second is going to be meters per second squared. So your, your units can be written a number of different ways. I will typically write it as this or this, um, but you may see it as meters seconds to the negative two as well. Okay. Um, a shorthand formula would be right here, that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity divided by time. On your formula sheet, I gave you Vf minus Vi divided by T. Your final velocity minus your initial velocity is your change in velocity. So you can kind of see it in a number of different ways, but just know it's however much your speed is changing by divided by your time. Okay, um, and then so the other important thing is that acceleration, because it's directional, it can be positive or it can be negative, okay? So if I'm traveling down the road and I'm calling that the positive direction and I slam on my brakes, I'm undergoing a negative acceleration, okay? But I could also say that if I were going down the road and I was calling that a negative direction and I slam on my brakes, it would be a positive acceleration. So you really gotta be careful on what the frame of reference is. So we're called back from going back to position your frame of reference and your change from that frame can be positive or negative. And so you really got to think about the direction attached when we're going through vector quantities. Um, then coming over here, uh, if something is slowing down or decelerating, its acceleration would be considered negative. Most times uh, it would be considered negative because usually when whatever direction we're going, we're going to be saying that's the positive direction. Um, and then, so this is another important thing, because uh, acceleration is a vector quantity, we have direction involved. So there are really three ways, I guess, that you could change your acceleration. You could change your direction, or you could change your speed, or you could do both, okay? So it is a change in direction, a change in speed, or both, okay? So just think about your car, Really, you have three ways in your car, or I guess four if you add both, um, ways of changing your, your acceleration. You can just turn the steering wheel. That is going to cause an acceleration because it's going to cause a change in direction. You can st uh, step on the gas pedal to accelerate the traditional way we think of accelerating. Or you can slam on the brake, which is another way of accelerating. Again, it's going to be in the negative direction, but it's still an acceleration because it's a change in velocity. Okay. Uh, and then so this picture just kind of shows that um, that this person, this kind of depicts what we call dot diagrams, and we will get to dot diagrams going on. In this case, we're showing the person, and each snapshot, if you will, is uh, a, an equal amount of time. So the, the time difference here and here and here is the same. So this shows somebody speeding up because they're, they're traveling a greater and greater distance per unit time, so this person is speeding up or accelerating. This person, same thing, the same amount of time increments between each picture, so this person is covering a smaller and smaller distance, so they are slowing down. So both of these are showing an acceleration. And then this B is just kind of flying in circles. Uh, the distance is the same pretty much in each picture, but because it's changing direction, it is still accelerating, okay? Um, so then coming on over here, so free fall. So free fall is an important thing that we're going to talk about. And uh, the, the nice thing is that the formulas are the same. Um, it's just when we do uh, physics problems and, we, and it's in regards to uh, free fall, 
you are going to be given a piece of information that you need to always pull out. That if you're doing free fall, you always know acceleration because the acceleration of gravity is constant. Okay. And so anytime it says like, you know, an object is dropped off of the building. If I say that, just that an object is dropped, dropped off the building. I've told you two things right there. Okay. So you have two of your givens just by saying an object is dropped off a building. First off, if it's dropped, you're going to let go of it. And therefore its initial velocity is going to be zero. That's the first piece of information you're given. Second, if I drop an object, it's going to accelerate under the influence of gravity, and I know that number to be 10 meters per second squared, okay? Um, so uh, this 10 meters per second per second, so G, the force of gravity or the acceleration of gravity is 10 meters per second squared, okay? It's a nice, easy number. Now, in, in reality, it is not exactly 10. We just use 10 because it's close enough to approximate what we're going for. But the actual acceleration of free fall is 9.8 meters per second squared. So if we were doing labs, and obviously right now we can't, but we will do a free fall lab because you can do this at home. Um, we'll we use 9.8 meters per second squared for that. Okay. So this table, and I kind of reproduced it on the paper for you, um, is, is really easy that uh, when we're talking about how fast something is going when we drop it, you know, if I drop it after one second, if it's accelerating at 10 meters per second squared for one second, then after one second, it will be going 10 meters per second. Okay. Um, and then it's just simple math from here. So after two seconds, well, if it was going 10 here and it's going to accelerate another 10 meters per second, here it will be 20, and then 30, 40, 50. It's nice and easy. So the cool thing about free fall is if you're calculating how fast something is going, it's really easy to figure it out. You just take the time and multiply by 10. So 10t will give you your speed of an object that is falling in free fall. Now, I kind of got ahead of myself, and I apologize. I want to come back up here. Um, because when we talk about free fall, it's a, it's a special situation. We're just saying, let's pretend air resistance doesn't exist, okay? So we neglect air resistance, and I, I should kind of point that out because obviously if you, if you drop something, it will experience air resistance, and so it won't follow this pattern right here. Eventually, it'll slow down, hit its terminal speed, and it will follow the exact same speed the whole way down. We'll cover that in a little bit. So coming down over here, uh, what is the instantaneous speed of an object that starts from rest? So we covered uh, earlier in the notes uh, from last time, uh, instantaneous speed and average speed. And there is an important difference between them. So remember when you're driving in your car and you look down at your speedometer, it is telling you your instantaneous speed, your speed at any given moment in time. So you slam on the brake, you're going to see your speedometer go down. So when I drop an object, how fast is it going at any particular time is the instantaneous speed. The average speed is the average over its entire journey. Okay. So uh, it starts from rest and it is in free fall for seven seconds. So coming back up here, if I want its instantaneous speed, all I do is 10 t. And the formula is going to look like this, that your velocity or your speed is equal to the acceleration of gravity times time. So I'm just going to, so here, gravity is put in there fully. Gravity is 10, right? So 10 times 7 in this case. And so the instantaneous speed would be 70 meters per second. Okay, because meters per second squared times seconds, the seconds cancel out, and you're left with meters per second instead of meters per second squared. The average velocity, and it's depicted by that little bar over it, is a little bit tougher, but um, and it's going to be confusing later on. We're going to have to kind of come back to this one, but right now, I think conceptually, you'd be like, oh yeah, I get that, and then when we apply it later, it might be a little confusing, but if I said it fell for seven seconds, what was its average speed over the entire journey? Well, you've got to recall that it started at rest. So it started at zero, 
And at the end of its journey, it was going at 70 meters per second. So on average, how fast was it going? And it would be akin to taking a test. Like you take the test the first time and you weren't in class for like the whole time. So you got a zero. And then you took the test again and you got a 70 out of 70. So what was your average score? Well, you got a zero and you got a 70. You got to add those two numbers up and then divide by two. And that's exactly what you do here. It looks different. It's like a crazy formula, but it's the exact same thing. I take my final velocity, which was 70. I take my initial velocity, which was zero, add them up, and I get 70. And then I divide by two, because there were two numbers involved. And so I get 35 meters per second. So the instantaneous speed after seven seconds would be 70 meters per second. The average speed after seven seconds would be 35 meters per second. Okay. We got that. So then this is kind of the application of that. And this is, so again, we're going to always say when we're talking about free fall in the absence of air resistance. So this guy here is throwing this ball up. It goes up. It's going to get to some high point, and then it's going to come back down. Okay. Uh, and so it's really important a lot of times when you're doing these free fall problems to visualize what's happening because that point right there is going to become like a real help for us later on when we're solving these uh, free fall problems. So rising objects, in other words, objects that are thrown up, uh, thrown straight up during upward motion, the object slows from initial velocity upwards to zero. Okay. That is a really important thing right there. Um, from initial velocity upward to zero. So it's kind of weird to think that when you throw something up in the air, that when it's up there, there's a time when its velocity is zero. But that's going to be really helpful for us when we're solving some problems later on. Okay, That when you throw it up, it has to stop before it, it's going up and then it comes down. Well, in between that up and down, it has to stop for, you know, just a brief moment, but it is zero at some point. So here at three seconds, its velocity is zero. At what rate does it slow down? So, and we're going to kind of look at this later on, that you can use time to figure out how fast he threw it up. Um, and so, and I'm going to kind of allude to that as we go right now. So here's at time zero. And then it came back to him at six seconds. Okay, so think about what happened. It went up for three seconds, and then it came down for three seconds. So take a second right now and try to determine how fast you think it was going when he threw it up. And I'm going to work backwards to, to kind of get to the answer. So think about this. Let's let's take out the part where he throws it up and let's just focus on this part right here where it falls because here its velocity is zero. And if its velocity is zero here, it's kind of like free fall where I can just take an object and drop it. Now remember what I said, that when you say you drop an object, you're given two pieces of information. One is that the initial velocity is zero. So if I drop an object from here, it's the same as if I threw it up, it gets to there and then falls. So this could be construed as my, or looked at as my initial velocity of zero. And then after one second, how fast would it be going? Well, it's under gravity, so it's accelerating at 10 meters per second per second. If it falls for one second, it will be going 10 meters per second there. And then when it gets to here, that would be two seconds, right? Because it was here at one, here is two seconds. 2 times 10 is my 20, and then at 3 seconds, it would be 30 meters per second. And you say, well, wait, that's 6 seconds. Well, remember, I took out the upward part, okay? So when it's going up, it is slowing down at 10 meters per second. So we threw it up at 30 meters per second. So it's going to go up for 3 seconds, and that's kind of an important thing to see. If I throw something up at 10 meters per second, how long will it go up for? 1 second because it will slow down at 10 meters per second per second. So if I throw it up at exactly 10 meters per second, it will stop in one second. If I throw it up at 50 meters per second, it will stop 
in five seconds. Okay. So here he throws it up. It's gonna it throws it up at 30. It's gonna slow down by 10. So after one second, it's going 20. After two seconds, it's going 10. And after three seconds, it's going zero. So we're also going to call this symmetry, that this side that's going up is going to exactly mirror this side that is coming down. So we'll come, come back to that later on. So remember here that's falling. It's accelerating back down, so it's going 10, 20, 30. So after another second, it will be going 40. Okay. Um, let's see. So... When the object starts to fall again, it will accelerate at the same rate toward the ground. Uh, also, at what, at what rate does it slow? That is at 10 meters per second per second. Okay, so every second will slow down by 10 meters per second. Uh, when the object reaches its original position, it was thrown from. What will its speed be? Well, that is right there. So 30 meters per second. Okay. Um, and we'll do some more examples like this next time because I have a, a, another thing that goes along with this that kind of shows this. So uh, for now, we're going to go on. So this is the part where people are going to get a little bit confused because there is a difference between how fast something is going and how far it goes. And this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing. So I think you really need to like concentrate on this part. So the distance it travels in the time that it is falling. Um, and so you'll see this formula right here, that the distance is equal to one-half at squared. Now remember that we know the a, because if it's falling, we're going to, instead of have the acceleration, some random acceleration, we can replace that with g. So really we're going to say that the distance is equal to one-half gt squared. So again, this is for free fall, for how far something falls. So we're assuming that its initial velocity is zero. Uh, because on your formula sheet, you are going to have a formula, and I'm going to write it off to the side here, that distance equals bit plus one half at squared. And this is where this formula is coming from. But recall that if I say I, oops, and I just dropped that. If I say that I drop something, my initial velocity is zero. So I'm going to take this whole term out and call it zero, and that's why we just have the one-half at squared. We're saying that we're just going to drop something, so it starts at zero, so I can take that part out. So this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing, okay? Um, and I'm going to kind of show two ways. I'm going to show the formula way, but I also want you to kind of understand what's happening here. So I have elapsed time zero seconds. So in zero seconds, something is going to fall no distance. That's easy. So after one second, how far will it fall? So I'm actually going to add a little column over here. And I'm going to fill it in. And I, I wish I had done this on your paper, but this just came to me. Uh, let's call it this its velocity. So if I see how fast will it be going if I drop it? Well, we just did this. And so this should be somewhat easy. Remember that it's going to accelerate at 10 meters per second per second. So, well, after no time, it'll be going zero meters per second. I'm going to write that meters per second. After one second, remember, if I drop it, it will be falling at 10 meters per second. And then after 2, 20, then 30 then 40, then 50, and then whatever time times uh, uh, 10, okay? So this is how fast it's going, but that is not how far it will fall, okay? So I'm going to give the, the conceptual overview first, and then I'm going to show you I can just use this formula, and it's nice and easy, okay? So if I drop it and it falls for one second, a lot of people are going to say, oh, it's going to fall 10 meters. It does not fall 10 meters. Okay, because you got to remember that it fell, but when it's falling for one second, it started at zero. It wasn't moving at all, and it didn't instantly go from zero to ten. It accelerated along the way, and at the end of that one second, it was traveling ten meters per second. Okay, so we have to look at its starting point, 
how fast it was going here and how fast it was going here, and then average that out. So on average, if I look at these two numbers, it was not traveling at zero or 10. It was traveling halfway between those numbers, and that's five meters per second. And if it was traveling at five meters per second for one second, well, that's how far it traveled, five meters. Okay. And then I can come over here and then say, well, all right, so it was falling for one second. At the end of that second, it was traveling at 10 meters per second. And then it's going to continue to fall. For another second, it's going to accelerate to 20. And so I'm going to look at those two numbers. And so what is my average between 10 and 20? So 10 plus 20 is 30. Half of 30 is 15. Now, my answer here is not going to be 15. It fell 15 meters between here and here. It had already fallen five, so I'm going to add these two up. So it's going to fall a total of 20 meters in that time. Okay. And then I can come over here and I can say, well, half, halfway between 20 and 30 is 25. Halfway between 30 and 40 is 35. Halfway between 40 and 50 is 45. And you're going to see that, that's, that it follows a pattern, and it's just going to keep on adding up like that. So when I, I was at 20, and then it's going to fall another 25, well, 20 plus 25 is going to give me my 45. And then it's going to go 35 more from that. So 45 plus 35 is 80. And then it's going to go from 80, and it's going to fall another 45. So this one will be 125, okay? That's one way of doing it. Here's another kind of a cool thing, and so I'm gonna kind of write it off to the side here. If I was told it fell for four seconds, I don't wanna go through all those different things right there, but I could just say this. I could say, well, it started at zero, and it went to 40. So on average, how fast was it falling in that time? Well, if I take the average between 0 and 40, I get 20. But 20 is not my answer there. But that's okay, because look at this. It was falling on average at 20 meters per second for four seconds. And so if I say it was moving at 20 meters per second for four seconds, 20 times 4 is going to give me my 80 meters per second. Okay, So I can do it like this way. Okay, just take my average speeds and go times my time. Or I could just say, all right, I understand this formula. I can say that my distance is equal to one half g, which is 10, times my time squared. So let's just let's just do the one we just did, the 80. So that was four seconds. So if I plug in a four here and square it, I'm gonna get four squared is 16. 16 times 10 and take half of that. Well, 16 times 10 is 160. Half of 160 is 80. Okay. If I wanted to do the one above it for three seconds, so instead of four, I'm going to do three. I'm going to have one half 10 times three squared. Three squared is nine. Nine times 10 is 90. Half of 90 is 45. Okay, so several ways of doing it, um, and hopefully that will make sense to you. But again, this is meant to show you that speed and distance, you got to keep those separate. You got to know what you're looking for there. Okay, so then this becomes what is generally speaking the most confusing thing for students to conceptually get. Okay. Um, and it's why I had to start off with the walking running lap, because I wanted you to kind of visualize what the graph is showing, what a steeper slope on a distance first time graph means, what a shallower slope means, uh, and so you can use that. And so this one, though, I, I'm going to kind of point out, and I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start class today with going over this, and I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. I'm going to keep it in the notes. I'm going to put it on here. But I'm also going to start class by going right to this. So um, distance versus time. 
this is right here. This graph here is my speed versus time. So how fast something is going over time. And if I look at that graph, from this graph, I want to say, well, how will distance versus time look? And then from this graph, how will acceleration versus time look? So what I'm asking you is to look at this graph and say, what does it show? What are you seeing when you look at a linear graph of speed versus time? And so I'm going to kind of examine this for a second and say, well, it's starting at 0, 0. And as time increases, speed is increasing. So... I think the easiest thing to do is to go from this one over to this one, okay? So if the speed is increasing, that's another way of saying that its velocity is changing. And recall that acceleration is a change in velocity. So this graph over here, I need to show what this is. Like, what is my acceleration? It's, it's a constant acceleration because it doesn't change. And what will that look like over here? Okay, so I can kind of visually come up with the answer here. I can say, well, after one second, it is 10. After two seconds, it is 20. But it went up 10 here. It went up 10 here. It's going to go up 10 there and 10 there, and 10 there. And so if I were to say, show me an acceleration versus time graph of that. So this is acceleration versus time. It would look like that if this number right there were 10. So if this is 0 and that's 10, that's what it would look like, a constant acceleration. To recognize that a flat line on an acceleration versus time graph is going to give me a linear line on a speed or velocity versus time graph. And the slope is going to be where I put my flat line. Okay. So then how is that going to affect distance? Well, I can kind of bring you back to what we just did in our notes, what we just said, that when the disc, when you drop something, it accelerates, right? It's going faster and faster. And as it goes faster and faster, it covers a larger and larger distance every unit of time. So let's say I started at zero. And so this one, again, is a distance versus time graph. If I started at zero, and let's do the free fall one. After one second, it traveled five meters. So I'm going to go over one second, and I'm going to go up to five. After two seconds, it went 20 meters. So here's two, 20 is up here. After three seconds, it went 45 meters. I'm going to go to three seconds and up to 45 meters. After four seconds, it went 80 meters. I had to think on that one. Four seconds and then 80 meters. And so you're going to see that you get an exponential here, okay? So um, three graphs, what does each one show? So this one, again, is speed burst time. It's showing that speed is increasing at a constant rate. Another way of saying that is that it has uniform acceleration. That number stays the same. It's accelerating. And if it's accelerating, it's covering a greater and greater distance every unit of time okay so i'm gonna scroll down here so for this right here this kind of is going back again to talk about displacement um, and distance and how they're related so what is the displacement for a below in 19 seconds so displacement a below in 19 seconds so here's a Starting at zero, let me do that in a different color. Starting at zero, and I want to go to 19 seconds, which is right there. So hopefully you will see that this is showing position right here. So position, 
And remember that displacement is your change in position over time. So if you start at zero, and then you go and you're doing all this stuff, but you come back to where you started from, your displacement is zero meters. So the displacement on here is zero. I could always also look at this and say, well, what did this person or car or whatever this object is do? Well, from here to here, it just sat there, right? So for the first two seconds, it didn't move. This is showing the position does not change. And then from two seconds to looks like five seconds, it went in the negative direction. So think of that as backing up, okay? So between here and here, it backed up. And so it, it covered three meters in the negative direction. Okay, so I'll, I'll say negative three, but it so it went backwards. And then after five seconds, then it started moving forwards. So this is showing first it went back and then it was moving forwards. And it moved forwards until seven seconds. And what distance did it travel then? Well, it went from negative three here to zero and then forward to three. And so, or two, is that two? Yeah, two. So it traveled five meters forward, okay? And then from seven seconds to uh, like 12 and a half seconds or whatever that is, it didn't move. It just sat there. A flat line on a position versus time graph is just showing something standing still. And then it went backwards. And again, a steep line like that on a position versus time graph is showing something moving quickly. And so the steeper it is, the faster it's going. So think of your uh, distance versus time graph. You had the walking and the running. So walking is not as fast, running is faster. Sprinting would be much faster. So it was going backwards at a rapid rate, but it went from two all the way down to negative six. So it went backwards by eight, so negative eight, okay? And then immediately started going forward and went from, again, from negative six to negative two, so that is a difference of four. And then stayed still, didn't move, and then went from uh, negative two to zero, so went two more. So when it asked what distance did it cover, I neglect the negatives. I don't care about negatives because distance is never negative. You always add. So we have three, and then so when three and five is eight, and eight is 16, and four is 20, and two more is 22. So the distance was 22 meters. In B, is there a constant acceleration? So it went, it's velocity, or this, wait, is that position? Yeah, that's position versus time. So it's position changed by 10, and then 10, and then 10, and then 10, and then 10. So again, you got to pay attention to what this is saying. This is position. Another way of saying position is like your distance that you travel. Well, if you travel 10 meters in one second, during that time, you were traveling at 10 meters per second. And then from here to here, you travel another 10 meters. So how fast were you going? You were going... 10 meters per second. And then you were traveling 10 meters per second. And you were traveling 10 meters per second all along here. So this is a position versus time graph. And on a position versus time graph, when you have that straight line, your speed didn't change. So you were not accelerating. So is there a constant acceleration? No. Acceleration equals zero. You might say that's constant, but it's zero. Okay, coming down over here, this is where I'm going to start the class today is kind of going over this. These are really confusing, but once you see the pattern, I, I would hope that it'll, it'll make sense to you, okay? So you're going to have already have set these up 
because I'm going to start class with this, but we have a stationary object. So again, something that's just sitting there. We have one that's in uniform motion, so one that's moving at a constant speed. And motion with a constant acceleration, so something that is speeding up. We're going to have a position versus time graph, velocity versus time graph, and acceleration versus time graph for each one. Okay. So if something isn't moving on a position versus time graph, so if I were just standing here and I said, show how my position changes, it would look just like this. My position doesn't change. And so over time, you would just have a flat line. Okay. So I drew it here at zero. I don't know that you can see it. So uh, basically, if we call that zero, now remember, position can be negative, so I could have drawn it anywhere. But if we call that zero, then you have a flat line there. Okay. If something is not moving, its position versus time doesn't change, so distance divided by time, but it doesn't cover a distance, then its velocity will also be zero. So I'm going to have a flat line there at zero. And then if its velocity doesn't change, well, acceleration is a change in velocity. So once again, your acceleration would be zero. Okay. So that part is easy. When something's not moving, it's easy. Flat lines all the way across. But if something is moving in uniform motion, so if something is moving at a constant velocity, its position does change, right? If I'm walking at a constant rate, my position changes. And so to show that, it changes the same amount each unit of time. So it goes, so one second, five meters, two seconds, 10 meters, three seconds, 15 meters. And you are going to get a constant line that looks like that. Okay. And so think about what that's showing. Just showing the same distance. Your slope is going to give you the next one in a way. It's going to show you how fast you're going. So one of the things on the walking running lab, you use the slope of your position versus time graph to tell you how fast you were going. Okay. And that didn't change. It was constant. And so we have a non-zero flat number. And this would be at whatever the slope is. So if I had a slope like this, that line would be there. If I had a slope like that, that line would be up here. The acceleration, now remember, acceleration is a change in velocity. How much is that changing? It's not. So you're going to have a line at zero, okay? Zero acceleration. So again, if these are zeros down here, okay? So for motion with a constant acceleration, and I'll probably show this to you guys uh, when we do this in the beginning, I find it easier, which whatever one it tells you, it's easier to start with that one. So like a stationary object, I'd start here. Uh, uniform motion, I would start here usually, because I'd say, all right, uniform means constant. So I just constant in my head, I can draw a flat line. So motion with a constant acceleration, well, that's like this, except now I'm talking about acceleration, okay? So a constant acceleration. It's, it's not zero. It's some number um, that's not zero. So here's a zero down here, and so it's constant. And so what will that do to the speed? Well, think about if you step on your gas pedal in your car, and let's say you constantly accelerate, what happens to your speed? Well, it goes up, right? But it goes up the same amount every unit of time. So if something accelerates under free fall, it's 10 meters per second per second. So it goes after one second, 10, 2, 20, 3, 30, 4, 40. So that's what we will see here is something changing at a constant rate. And then coming over to here, so again, if something is going faster, so if it's going zero meters per second, this is how far it travels in one second. If it's going 10 meters per second, now it's going, it's going to cover a bigger distance. And then 20, and then 30. And so that number gets bigger and bigger, and so this becomes your exponential curve. Okay? I think there's last one right here. Uh, oh, no, one more after this. So air resistance and falling objects. So remember, when we talk about free fall, we're saying in the absence of air resistance. It doesn't exist. 
Well, it does exist and it does slow things down. Okay. I drop a piece of paper and I drop a brick. They certainly don't hit the ground at the same time. So air resistance noticeably slows the motion of objects with a large length. Well, why does a piece of paper take a long time to hit the ground? Because it's really big, right? So surface area. You increase the surface area, you will increase the amount of, um, of air resistance or friction. So we have three skydivers here. Who is falling the slowest? Well, this guy, why, if they're all the same weight, why is this guy falling slower? Because he has increased his surface area by pulling the chute. This guy is kind of, he's hit his terminal speed. He's kind of just falling like this, but he's increasing his surface area. If you ever watch the skydivers jump out of planes, they can catch up to one another and link hands by changing their orientation in the sky. So if you want to, if you were up here, you want to catch up to him, you kind of, change your surface area, and you would shoot down and be able to catch up to them, okay? So large surface areas and small weight, but less noticeably affects the motion of objects with smaller surface areas. So if you were to reduce the surface area, instead of taking the paper, which is all spread out, crumple it up and drop it, it will fall much faster, and a large weight. So if I take a beach ball and a cannonball, and I try to throw them, I can get, well, the cannon, maybe I can't throw that far, but uh, you, the air resistance is going to have much less effect on the cannonball than it would on a beach ball, okay? All right, so then an object is dropped from a building. How fast will it be going if it takes 3.7 seconds to hit the ground? How tall is the building? So this is the beginning of the notes. How fast will it be going? That's when you're gonna use gravity. So velocity equals GT, gravity times time. Well, gravity is 10. Time in this case is 3.7. So this is really easy when you're trying to do the speed. It doesn't even matter if you use decimals or anything. If something falls for 1.83 seconds and it, uh, it's under gravity, you just move the decimal over. So it would be 10 point whatever. I, I don't even know what number I said, but you just move the decimal. So 3.7 seconds, um, how fast will it be going? 37 meters per second, okay? So you just take velocity equals GT equals 10 times 3.7 equals 37 meters per second. So that part's easy. The distance, remember, that's the one that you got to think, well, it started at zero and then it accelerated to 37. I could take the average of zero and 37 multiply that average times 3.7, or I could just plug it into my formula that distance equals one half g t squared equals, and I'm gonna have to bust out my calculator because I can't do this, uh, one half 10 times 3.7 squared. And if I do that, 3.7 squared times five equals, so 68.45, meters okay so again speed is not distance if air resistance were taken into account how would these numbers be affected well if you drop something off of a building and air resistance is taken into account it's going to fall slower and if it's falling slower this 3.7 seconds will increase it will take longer to hit the ground because it won't be going as fast um, and then that will throw this completely off so uh, this number here the 37 meters per second would go down and the time to hit the ground would go up the building would still be the same height it would just take longer to fall and it wouldn't fall so as fast okay all right the very last thing I know this has been long I'm sorry so how fast how far how quickly how fast changes so when I first saw this in the book, I was like, what the heck are they talking about? And they were just trying to make sure you understand the difference between how fast, well, what are we talking about when we say how fast? We're talking about its speed or its velocity. How far? We're talking about distance. How much distance does it cover? And that's gonna depend on how fast it's going or how much it's accelerating. The how, the how quickly, how fast changes. That's acceleration, and a lot of times students confuse acceleration with velocity. 
So remember that acceleration is a change in velocity. So you step on the gas, you step on the brake, you're changing your velocity. How fast are you doing that? If you slam on the brake, you change how fast you're going quickly. If you jam on the accelerator, you change how fast you are going quickly. If you just gently step on either pedal, you change that more slowly. So that's your acceleration. How quickly are you changing your velocity? Okay. And then so uh, again, your formulas you are you're kind of already hopefully getting a little bit more familiar with are there for you. Okay. So I hope these notes help and you can kind of go back and stop and, and do what you need to, to kind of understand them. I will say going forward, the motion graphs position versus time, speed versus time, acceleration versus time, trying to show what's happening when something is, it, it gets really confusing. You really got to focus on what is the graph showing? Speed versus time. Okay, that's showing me how fast something is moving. What does a change look like? Okay, so uh, negative velocity, positive, all those things kind of come into play and it gets confusing. I have to stop and think all the time. Like, wow, what, what's going on in this graph? Okay. I did put on the Khan Academies uh, as a um, way of kind of getting through that. So in Khan Academy, there are a bunch of motion graphs and that kind of explain some of the videos. I put the videos on there. You're not required to watch those videos. They help. Um, so if you find yourself getting confused, the videos help. And they kind of walk you through like, Look at this part of the graph. This is what's happening. So hopefully those Khan Academies are not just busy work. They're meant to like help you. Um, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. We have the end of this week and then next week um, on Friday, I'll ask you if you'd rather have the, the, the quiz on Thursday or Friday, whatever the majority says we'll do. Um, but hopefully, uh, we'll have enough practice between now and then to make sure that you, you get this concept, okay? We're done with the notes, so this is everything. I know there's a lot, okay? Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you guys in, well, I'm going to see you shortly. <laughs> Bye.